Simon, it is uh, such a pleasure having you today. Thank you very much for being with us. Thanks for having me, Martin. Long time no speak, right? Listen, let's, let's get started. I mean, we obviously have to talk a little bit about the pandemic. Um, so looking into the worldwide pandemic, I think um, it clearly has put healthcare center stage, I think for many or even for all of us. What has been um, the biggest complication uh, GE Healthcare has addressed due to the coronavirus? Was it maybe the supply chain? Was it patient experience or something else? How did GE rise to the occasion? I mean, look, um, it's no secret that this pandemic has been a wake of call for the entire industry and maybe the entire world, right? Um, it's the first of its kind happening, at least in my life. And um, on the one hand, it shows how fragile um, healthcare is and the healthcare systems are. I mean, you saw the photos from, from New York, from, from France, from Spain, from Italy, from all over the world. Um, on the other hand, I believe it's an accelerator for innovation and also for digital technology. And um, if you see GE Healthcare as medtech and technology and IT provider, um, the first thing that we did is like clearly going um, to our customers to understand where do they have the most boring needs, right? And this at the end is keeping up your critical operations. Um, there are various medtech devices which are involved, like ventilation, like CTs, so computer tomographs, um, like ultrasound machines that help in the diagnosis of, of COVID, but also to treat intensive care patients. And there was the biggest need, and we ramped up operations there quite, quite heavily. And um, this went even so far that employees from GE who normally work in administrative jobs, like marketing, finance, or something else, they volunteered to work in factories to assemble ventilation devices, right? Um, this was um, the first, let's say, um, the biggest uh, um, point we made in the beginning. Then we also had very new partnerships with unsuspected um, candidates like Ford, for example, because they have the production lines, we have some knowledge, and we partnered to, I think it was, assemble 50,000 um, ventilators, which are critical in the first phase of the pandemic, um, to uh, in within 100 days. Um, so first, it was to keep the operations of customers running and address the most urgent departments. Now, in the later stage where we are, I mean, going to the second wave, I believe that it becomes more important where also my part of the business is, which is developing AI. So developing artificial intelligence to detect COVID, right? To see like um, um, which patient um, could have COVID. Secondly, to also do the triaging um, to say this situation is likely more critical than another one. And the third point is to um, deal with all the backlog that is coming up right now, because a lot of elective surgery has been pushed out and um, people don't get less sicker because of COVID, right? Um, but you may treat people later and this backlog has to be addressed somehow. So we, um, we develop kind of devices that tell you um, which patient is um, more likely to be treated in the future because he's a severe sick, right? Um, these are the main things we work around. I think um, if you take uh, the one thing that we did, there's not the one thing. Um, first thing was to keep basically operations running in hospitals. Second thing right now is to help um, basically to smooth the process. And the, the last thing, which is also important, is enable our um, customers to work from home, right? Because in the past, a lot of treatment happens at the point of care. Right now, we enable them to, for example, in radiology, um, read um, the scans from home. And these are the, the three main facts, I would say, where GE um, is still um, working on and, and living up to, to addressing COVID. So you already said GE is essentially as well a technology company. Um, let's talk about one really cool piece of technology, which is artificial intelligence. Um, GE Healthcare has actually recently launched an art artificial intelligence algorithm that helps to detect critical conditions related to COVID-19 patients. Um, can you tell us a little bit more about how GE is integrating AI into its workflows? Mm -hmm. I mean, that's a, that's a good point. At the end, I believe that artificial intelligence is likely to be the technology that changes um, um, our sector most. That's also what research shows, correct? Um, if you see what AI does in healthcare, it's four things. Um, it helps you to triage, to tell, I talked about this before, to tell you this patient has a more critical condition than somebody else, right? It helps you also um, to take 
more informed decisions, right? Because it predicts certain likelihoods that something could happen. A third important point is what you talked about, the COVID algorithm, where it helps you to basically augment your reading. So radiologists, they are very trained in looking through scans and find conditions, but artificial intelligence never sleeps and may augment your capabilities there. That's uh, um, the third point where AI um, gets very um, powerful. And the last one is in doing monotonous tasks like reporting at the end, it automates processes and takes at the end time away from the physician that, um, that, it ca that he or she can spend with a patient. I mean, there's a very interesting fact that at the end, um, physicians and clinicians only um, spend 27% of their time at the patient. This at the end leaves you with the majority doing administrative tasks, which are not really um, adding any value. And that's where AI comes in. You ask me how we implement AI in, um, into uh, workflows. I mean, there's, um, there is not such a thing like the, the recipe, but there are various steps I think you have to um, get right by implementing an AI. Uh, AI. The first one is, um, it's about the user experience. So physicians normally work in a very hectic environment where um, they follow a kind of workflow or process that has to be right, right? If you change something there, it, um, it gets difficult for them to adopt these kind of technologies, right? So we try to seamlessly integrate it in the tasks that they already do. That's one important factor. The second, um, I think, um, success criteria is to um, basically deploy AI first there where your customer generates value and where the biggest potential is, which is in treatment in healthcare, right? In another on the street, it might be somewhere else, but you focus on this one first. Then AI is not for everybody. That's also something I believe is important. You have to, um, to look into hospitals that are already good in digitization to start this kind of journey, right? Because um, they can build on a strong digital knowledge to get um, also to implement a very advanced technology like AI. That's the second um, important criteria. The third one is, I believe, there are um, enablers that have to be in place always, which is the right people who know about it, right? Um, to have a general um, top-down approach as well, where it's a priority in the business or in the, in the operations. And um, you need to be able to also treat with large data, um, uh, I'd say amounts, which is important. Last but not least, you have to convince um, the end user, which is the doctor, in hospitals, and there it's important to double down on change management, right? This industry acts on certain kind of proof points, like studies, outcome studies. Um, they believe a lot in, in these facts. So you have to prove that your AI actually is working and making a difference. And these are the four main criteria I would say you have to get right implementing AI in the healthcare sector. Well, it sounds certainly quite straightforward. Um, we, <laughs> Maybe we it's not. <laughs> We, we spoke a bit about um, obviously this um, artificial intelligence algorithm that you developed yourself, but um, at the same time, GE Healthcare has just moved to acquire a Swedish startup um, in order to get access to uh, a photon counting technology, which apparently improves um, your, T, your CT scanners. Um, how does uh, GE Healthcare go about finding promising startups that could complement or, or support your products and services? I mean, you talk for sure about Prismatic, which um, uh, basically helps us, you're right, it's photon counting, which is the technology. I'm not an engineer, so um, I know what it does. At the end of it, it does, it helps you to create sharper images in CT with less radiation, which is important, right? Because radiation um, exposure is not good for anybody. And it actually, this startup opens new new ways for us because you leapfrog the, um, the way how you um, how you see images um, at the end. It helps the final user um, to see sharper images and detect heart conditions and, and, and failures earlier and um, also cancer so that you are able to see way better um, the kind of condition um, a patient might have um, um, like you see right now. Um, you ask me how we integrate startups. That's a, in such a big ship like GE, these are two different worlds and we talked about this in the past. Um, but what we do is we have so-called acceleration programs. It started in the US, we have one in, in, in China active, we have one in India active, and we are recently launching one also in our region, in um, Europe, Middle East and Africa, um, first starting in Europe, um, in, in um, in UK, sorry. And what's important there is we bring together four different kind of worlds, which is important. First one is 
our customers. So um, healthcare providers, hospitals and DLX, because they know a lot about the clinical stuff, right? We bring together our expertise as GE Healthcare. We are good in technology, also in IT, but we are, might be not as fast as, as, as startups are. And then um, the third ingredient here is the startup as such. So um, they come in and the fourth one are industry partners. So um, the big techs who are also better in certain kind of um, development than we are. And um, we work together in a so-called um, yeah, accelerator where we then basically determine clear tracks where all, you know, all of these four have to work together. And the main tracks we focus on is clearly artificial intelligence. That's one, mainly in the clinical part and because we know how this works together with our customers and startups can um, basically uh, add on our value props there. Then we have a second track, which goes into what we call operational artificial intelligence. So everything that optimizes your workflows. And the last one um, is around patient experience, which for me is the most exciting topic because that's something where for sure our entire sector has to um, do a lot more. But um, if you ask me how we um, basically work with startups, these acceleration programs or developer programs are the way that we are um, doing it in GE Healthcare at least at this point in time. Then there's also for GE, a venture arm, which is a normal venture capital funding organization, but that's um, for the entire GE business. Um, if you ask me how we do it in our business, we basically do it through acceleration programs. Mm -hmm. So, so let's stay a little bit on the theme of innovation. And obviously you are familiar with the global innovation parameter. Um, and actually, according to the results of uh, this year's study of 2020, um, we see that 88% of executives uh, agree that innovation is more important than ever before. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, they feel, or the, a large percentage, 42% say that, COVID-19 had a negative impact on their ability to innovate. Um, could you maybe share with us um, some additional findings from that study? I mean, you said that I, um, I'm aware about that. It sounds geeky or maybe nerdy, but um, I actually really have it in my agenda when this thing is released every year. It's like a child waiting for the birthday cake. Um, it, it's, it's no joke because I think it's a, it's a good indicator about the mood in, across industries, across the world, right? And what we do there normally, I think it's now the seventh edition or the eighth, I have to look this up. But um, um, what we do there is we ask over 3,000 executives around the world about how they perceive innovation in the, um, at this point in time. And this year, um, what I think is especially exciting is that it's done um, throughout the COVID period. Um, so within a pandemic, within an extreme situation. You mentioned already the good news um, that executives still think innovation is important, um, uh, but there are way more interesting findings, I guess. And the first one where I was um, really, um, let's say, surprised by is how different regions perceive at the end um, innovation and who the innovation leader is. If you ask, for example, the um, U-Scan, so US, Canada, Europe, and China, who they think are the champions in innovation, they said the US. Then if you go, for example, to Africa and you go to the Middle East, um, the answer was different. They said China is the leader. And then if you go to Latin America, the answer is Japan. So for me, this was the first um, basically um, takeaway where like, oh, this is not, not consistent and very interesting, right? Because the perception in parts of the world is different. Um, then selfishly, another um, example with, where I'm very, let's say, proud of and which gives me hope is that the first time healthcare has been seen as the most innovative sector addressing the, um, the crisis um, because normally the healthcare sector is always in the middle of the pack in terms of innovation. Normally it's the big techs, it's high tech, it's telecoms. These are the ones that get all the, let's say, the glamour and the, the props. If you now go, um, it's the first time that um, that healthcare is first. And I think this has to do with the pandemic because we quickly were able to implement innovation um, uh, at this point in time and also uh, seeing the fruits out of that. Um, the main, let's say, doubts which are out there is that due to the current pandemic, um, basically innovation gets blocked a little bit. Um, the main uh, reasons for that, if I remember well, were mobility, investment, and that collaboration is not possible across um, countries. So there is some kind of protectionism ongoing. Um, this was one fact that also kind of worries me. 
Um, what else do we have? I mean, for me, the most exciting part was really that I seen in our sector um, such a good positioning of innovation at this point in time. If you talk about AI, this was a thread um, before um, of our um, uh, talk is, the good thing is that everybody sees this as um, uh, the future technology that um, helps to not just address the pandemic, but also to improve well-being of individuals. And that's also something I, I see quite positive. So obviously it's um, one of the key buzzwords that you just used was AI. Um, obviously we hear a lot about cybersecurity, mm. telehealth, healthcare, staffing shortages and prices and so forth. What do you think um, are the major challenges in 2021 for the healthcare industry? What would you say? And obviously why? <laughs> that's, a, that's actually a tough question, to be honest. I mean, if you see our aim, it's always the same. It's improving at the end the access to healthcare for everybody, population health. Right, it's um, reducing the costs in the system and that their efficiency comes to play. It's in enhancing patient experience and it's making the um, the work of healthcare professionals better. I mean, we talk about the quadruple aim here, and that's when you ask, which is always the challenge to reach these um, the equilibrium across these four. Um, if you ask me what is most important in Q4, I think it uh, sorry in, in, um, in next year, I think it's the amount of change that's um, coming towards healthcare professionals. I mean, there are so many developments within healthcare that were now pushed and, um, and basically accelerated by COVID. And you mentioned one, telehealth will be the new normal, right? Not just because of COVID, also because of convenience. You don't have to travel to the doctor anymore. And we see this already that a lot of um, healthcare institutions invest in that. Um, the second big factor um, is around um, financial distress of hospitals at this point in time. If you take my, where I left Germany, for example, roughly 12% this year are in red numbers um, and they're not able to, to make their numbers. And this will be even worse with COVID, right? Because elective surgery is pushed out or elective procedures are pushed out. And this is um, income which is not coming right now for them, right? So there will be for sure um, a big push towards efficiency going forward. We see new business models popping up around the world and also new um, uh, new uh, players in healthcare, like the big techs who focus on this one. Um, a very interesting fact is also regulation. It's actually playing for us right now. In the past, we are quite regulated sector. Um, this year, again, I take Germany as example, we get reimbursed by law for using mobile phone apps. In healthcare, I mean, an app gets the same kind of, let's say, um, position like a, uh, like medicine at this point in time, or like a pharmaceutical, and, um, and that's um, really new for us, and we have to see how we address that. Then on the other side, we also see I talked about the ecosystem partnerships. He was never thinking about, right? We 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 saw, saw our partnership with Ford. We we partner with Roche SGE Healthcare, but you also see competitors partnering. Um, in, in the developing of drugs to basically address this. So this ecosystem is becoming first tangible and um, will become more important. We talked about cybersecurity, um, also a big, big, big um, concern at this point in time, because if you open up, um, like let's say doors for telehealth, um, you also have to treat with cybersecurity. And we had the first case as well, like um, 30 kilometers away from where I live, um, where a person died in the university hospital due to a ransomware attack because the machines were not working, right? Um, but so this is something we have to also um, uh, address in, in the coming, let's say, months. And the last one is artificial intelligence. So if you ask me, um, um, the challenges is to cope with all this change. That's one. But I believe if there are challenges, you also have always opportunities. And that's why I'm so excited to be in healthcare. And um, look, 2021 will be for sure a challenging, but also an exciting year. I guess for healthcare and for people who live in this industry. Uh, absolutely, exactly. I mean, from challenge comes opportunity. So let's hope for that. <laughs> Simon, Simon, let's become a little bit more personal. Um, you've actually been working at General Electric uh, since 2011, um, right after you completed your international MBA at IE Business School. Um, looking back over the past nine years, um, what would you say, what are some of the key learnings you would like to share with the business school community? Mm -hmm. I mean, look, the first one, it's, you just reminded me how old I get, nearly 10 years. I'm <laughs> sorry, anyway, it's getting, I, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> it's been 10 years next, next year, actually, that I'm, that I'm out of IE Business School. And um, 
Look, there's, I think, a lot of learnings I, I, I could share, but let me pick, pick some out. The first one is, um, I'm very much a person that believes in data. And we learned all of these concepts in business school also afterwards, and in my case, also before I um, joined business school consulting, how to take decisions. And none of those involves gut feeling. It's always based on data, it's based on, um, on, um, on uh, technologies, and it's based on um, frameworks you can use to take a decision. What I think um, um, you should get good in is listening to your, your gut feeling a little bit more. And that's what um, I call this my behams, so my big, hairy, and audacious moments in life, which could be personal or could be professional. But whenever you have a gut feeling, um, it is there for a reason. It doesn't mean don't do that, but um, you, you have to learn how to use that um, also better than just only rely on information. And that's something I think that comes with, with seniority a little bit, that you learn how to, um, to address that. The second big factor that I always um, um, think is important is to get out of your office, right? And um, you get, um, that's what I learned when you also become um, from manager to executive, that you lose somehow um, the, the, basically the pulse from the ground. And you just get it if you go there, right? If you go and work the factory, or, or if you go to the hospital and you talk to customers and, and patients and, and are there at the end, um, the same with your employees. Um, you learn this a lot, again, also in business school, if you read Lean Startup or Lean, where G is very big on, they always tell you to do that. But if you look into your life, you're not doing that that often. So I'm um, getting off your desk and basically talking to the frontline um, or talking to frontline workers whatever your sector is, is very important. And that's something what I learned and what I actually scheduled to do more, I'm right? Um, a third um, thing is also to look more externally, um, not only in your company, because you get very much um, used to doing um, things uh, in your safe environment and you don't um, basically look across or, or um, to other sectors or outside of your company. That's also something which I can just encourage and which I also tell my team to do quite a lot, right? I tell them like, look, I want from your new ideas, um, basically go somewhere else to get this to me and for me. And for me. Um, that's an important one. The last one is this kind of, um, uh, yeah, um, yeah, allow your teams to make errors. That's also something where, especially as German, where perfectionism is a big one, um, we are not good at. Um, right, but that's something where I also think um, you have to get this kind of how do you say that? Like, um, ah, um, how does it, how is this word called? That you get comfortable with it. Right? It's not um, in the past. You were very much about avoiding errors, and that's something in a big corp which errors are never perceived well. But you um, you have somehow created the space for your team to do so. And last but not least, and this is not you don't pay me for that. Um, it is you have to connect back to um, to IE. That's something that I learned. The first years, there were little contact. And then after years three or four, you start again to talk to um, to alumni and to, the, to your former professors. And it's always a very enriching experience. So that's something where I really tell you guys, um, do this more. I do this for the last, now, as, as I said, the first years, it, there was other things more exciting, like your work. But now I um, this kind of relationship with IE um, is really, valuable and um, I always say my MBA first I thought it ended 2011 right now I, I hope it ends somewhere in 2050 2060 when I'm basically not around anymore but yeah this would be my nuggets of wisdom for you guys at this point in time. <laughs> Simon thank you so much for your nuggets of wisdom um, obviously as well allow me to use this opportunity to thank you that you're such an engaged member of our alumni community because you're not only helping out, out with this particular interview but you help us out on, on many occasions so obviously thank you very much for that um, wishing you all the best as well not only for 2021 but obviously as well for the rest of this year thanks for being with us same here